Hello everybody, my name is Matt and here we're going to be talking about shock patients and what exactly shock index is. So before we go into shock index, we need to know what shock is. Shock is a life-threatening condition where the organs become hypoperfused and start to infarct and obviously die. What if I gave you two patients and I asked you who is perfusing better? Would it be the patient with the blood pressure of 105 over 42? Or would it be the patient with a blood pressure of 90 over 50? Well, the patient with a blood pressure of 105 over 42 has a MAP of 63. And the patient with a blood pressure of 90 over 55 has a MAP of 67. So the correct answer uh, is the patient with a blood pressure of 90 over 55. So what we learn from this, we need to stop thinking Oh, well, their systolic is high, so they are fine. Diastolic is more important than systolic because we spend about two-thirds of our lives in it, and obviously the two-thirds of the cardiac cycle is in diastole. Vasopressor guidelines set in clinic critical care settings and hospitals aim for a MAP of 65. At 65 millimeters of mercury, the body is able to adequately perfuse all of your organs. So what do we need to think about on every single hypotensive patient? I'm going to show you guys a list created by Dr. Omo 2 so that way when it's 2 a.m. and you're on your 14th cup of coffee just dragging, you can remember this little mnemonic and it could save your patient's life. The mnemonic is called SHOCKED. S stands for septic and spinal. H stands for hypovolemia and hemorrhagic. O means obstructive, which includes your tamponade, your massive PE, and your tension pneumo. Something to keep in mind is that if you give fluid bolus to a patient and their blood pressure plummets, think massive PE. This is because the embolism gets stuck in the lungs and causes the back pressure into the right ventricle. If you keep pounding these patients with fluids, the pressure from the right ventricle will cause the cardiac septum to shift over to the left ventricle more. This impairs left ventricle diastolic filling, which in turn lowers your cardiac output causing your hypotension. We will go into PE in the next slide and how to treat it and we'll hit on the cardiac tamponade just a little bit on the ECG. Well, because I love EKGs and this is my lecture, so. So back to the mnemonic. C stands for cardiogenic shock and compartment syndrome, which also includes your abdominal compartment syndrome as often forgotten about. Some causes of this can be your, uh, include your massive intra-abdominal bleeding or retroperitoneal hemorrhage of your gut edema and a couple others. So your trauma patient has been ejected off a motorcycle Always keep this in the back of your head. Now anyways, K stands for endocrine and anaphylactic with a K. And finally, D stands for drugs. So some drugs that we can that we see can cause hypertension are obviously your opiates, your beta blockers, your erectile dysfunction medications such as Cialis or Vi Viagra, and your diuretics such as like Lasix or HCTZ, uh, just to name a few. Studies show for every hour of delay in treating our shock patients, mortality increases 4 to 5%. So do not delay in resu uh, resuscitating these patients. Now let's get into the PE. On a 12 lead, you need to forget about the whole S1, Q3, T3 that you're taught in school. As this is a very sensitive finding and only occurs in about 20% of your PE patients, to diagnose a PE, you need to do a thorough exam in history. Has a patient been traveling for hours recently? On a flight or driving, are they a trucker? Are they not taking their blood thinners when they're on AFib or something like that? Has your female patients been taking their birth control? Next, you do your awesome 12 lead and you look for tachycardia, which is a sign that shows up in almost every single PE. Next, you look for some right axis deviation, which I'm showing here at the bottom of the slide. And you start asking yourself some questions. Is there a right bundle branch block or ST elevation in V1 and AVR? Any sides of RVH? So like there's going to be your T wave inversions in V1 through V4. Any T wave inversions, your rightward looking leads such as like your inferior leads 2, 3, AVF. If you have any of those with a great history, think PE. As I said in the previous slide, if you give fluid boluses to a massive PE patient, you can expect a drop in blood pressure. So how would we treat this patient? Obviously, manage your ABCs. You should consider a vasopressor such as like push dose epinephrine. This would enhance the right ventricular function using positive inotropic effects, which are going to increase the strength of the muscular contraction. This would obviously increase the MAP by causing peripheral vasoconstriction without having to increase the pulmonary vascular resistance by a lot. Now let's look at a massive PE on a 12 lead. You can see this is going to be a sinus tack, and you can see your T wave inversions in V1 through V5, which shows some sort of de some degree of right ventricular strain. There's also right axis deviation. Now let's touch on cardiac tamponade next. 
The cardiac tamponade on this is going to be really, really short. Here you can see a sinus tack, but what else do you see? Well, if you look closely, you can see the QRS complex is tall and shrinks and gets taller again. Let's see it over here, tall, short, tall, short. This is called an electrical alternons and is caused by the heart swinging back and forth within the fluid filled precordial uh, sac. This is just a cool EKG trick to help you think about tamponade. Now back to the main lecture. So what is better, MAB or systolic blood pressure? Well, if you've been paying attention, you should have picked up that I kind of bashed systolic blood pressure and told you mostly to focus on a map of 65 millimeter, millimeters of mercury in, or greater to adequately perfuse your organs. Now, here's a little dad joke to lighten the mood. Why don't we ask to maintain maps? Because we have GPS. Now, I hope you guys love that little knee slapper right there because I love me some dad jokes. Anyways, so let's go back into why systolic blood pressure is inferior with the example I gave before a couple slides ago about which patient is perfusing better. Uh, the one with the higher systolic blood pressure was not perfusing the patient as well as the lower systolic with a higher diastolic. To find the map, you can use the formula I put on the bottom of the screen to the left, or you can just look at this number over here. So now for the pecking order of blood pressures. Here is the pecking order. It goes MAP, diastolic, the dirt, the worms inside the dirt, and then systolic. Any questions? Good, now let's get to the fun stuff. So now we'll talk about shock index. The shock index is an assessment done by a provider to give you a number that tells you the level of shock, especially like in your trauma or acute hemorrhagic patients, based off of just two vital signs, your heart rate and your systolic blood pressure. Now I wish they used MAP or diastolic, but this is what we're given using this formula. The normal shock index is between 0.5 and 0.7. So when you get the 0.8, patients outcomes have started to take a turn for the worse and anything over 0.9 is extremely concerning so when do we do this we do it with any trauma patient or bleeding patient that may need any kind of transfusion we also use it for pre-intubation patients to identify which patients are most at risk for post-intubation hypotension and our patients with suspected sepsis this is as sens sensitive as sears uh, that we should all be very familiar with and there are studies out there that shows that we need to be using shock index to guide fluid resuscitation in sepsis in a study on patients in sepsis a shock index of 0.8 or greater showed these patients were three times more likely to present with hyperlactemia versus patients with a normal shock index. For you medical activists out there, the reason why some patients crash after intubation is caused by the loss of adrenergic tone due to the sedative or paralytic drugs, or it can also be caused by the increase in intrathoracic pressure due to positive pressure ventilation, which negatively affects the venous return, which is also called your preload. A study done on post-intubation hypotension states that this occurs in 22% of the patients inside the trial and 3% of the patients experience cardiac arrest. Post-intubation hypotension caused a higher in-hospital mortality rate, but the strongest indicator of the post-intubation hypotension can be determined by the shock index. So anything over 0.8 is bad. So maybe we need to start thinking about resuscitating these patients just a little bit more. You know, give them some fluids, uh, maybe a push dose presser uh, to help them and aim for the shock index of 0.5 to 0.7, as close as you can get to that without delaying, obviously, providing an advanced airway. Time for a little recap. At the end of the day, if you aren't thinking about a diagnosis, you won't be able to find it. So please make sure you use this shock mnemonic as a, I provided by Dr. Alma too, to help you when you're just scratching your head, not knowing what to do. And finally, treat shock aggressively. Instead of thinking time is brain, think time is organs. Aim for that map of 65 millimeters of mercury and above and do a shock index on your patients prior to intubation to see if these patients will crash. And if they do, and if they do have a high score, resuscitate them a little more. All right, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture and you guys have a great day.